Suicide Squad is a war film at its heart. I thought it was really important to make the movie R-rated from the beginning. Okay. I wanted the film to have some veracity in terms of the war movie aspect of it. You really believe that these are gonna be the characters that we're gonna follow for a majority of the film. When we arrive, everyone thinks, oh, it's going to be peaceful, you know, let's have a Mai Tai, let's have a massage, where's my towel? Mm -mm. Things go downtown Julie Brown very, very quickly. He contacted the fucking Cordo Maltese army. What the? This is going wrong six ways till Tuesday. This is, this is not good. Everyone is exploding, genitals, heads, arms, legs, toes. Anyone can die in a James Gunn movie particularly a Suicide Squad movie. We built an entire beach. It was the biggest set I think I've ever worked with in my life, and definitely the most complicated, interesting set. They built a beach in Atlanta with real palm trees, with waves. I mean, it's just mental. They have, I think, at least $300 to spend on all of the production design. It shows. I think we were all mind blown somewhat when we first stepped down there. It was totally bizarre and cool. We had all the conveniences of shooting on a back lot and then all the beauty of shooting on a beach. The beach had quite a bit of fire protecting work. We had the ambush, so we had a lot of bullet hits, missile hits, we had fire. I felt like I was in a war zone. There's explosions going off around you and those little we had our heroes running up the beach with pyrotechnics, sometimes within three feet of them, and we had the fire within 10 or 15 feet of them. A lot of the sand blasting up around the cast, the characters, we used high-pressure air mortars until we could get just a little bit further back from them, and then we used benzoyl peroxide for the fire effects, and then as we went further back, we used gasoline and stuff for the bigger fireballs. So we kind of layered the pyro so that we could get up close and personal with the pyro around the cast. Your adrenaline's through the roof because A, you're hearing the explosions, you're smelling the gunpowder, and you know that you kind of only really got one or two chances at it. That just ups the ante and you kind of like, it takes it to another place. This is a movie about a bunch of sad sack soldiers. These are crappy supervillains in the DC universe and they're set out to war and I wanted to see that in action. Got it. Hey guys! Get down you dude! What went wrong? Oh my God, what went wrong? I brought everybody, look, they're all right here. We got a deal, right? What the fuck is Blackguard doing? Blackguard sold us out. I wish I could tell you what was taking place on that beach, but I got killed too fast to even be on set for that to be happening. So I have no fucking idea. We have the shocking deaths at the beginning, but you know, they're characters we haven't met before. Is this thing a dog? I went to my brother and I said, please let me play a superhero. So of course he gave me the most pathetic superhero in the history of comic books. Bam, he falls in the water and he can't swim. And that's, that's curtains for Weasel. The Weasel is dead! I repeat, the Weasel is dead! PDK is just a guy whose arms and legs come off. That's his only power. Formidable? No. Annoying? Yes. These are TDK's very strange detachable arms. That's what it looks like on the inside when he pops his arms off. It's a really crappy power. It doesn't do anything. His arms don't have any sort of force to them. I didn't quite die, just a lot of injuries. Let's keep our fingers crossed for TDK. Maybe a spin-off series, maybe a, something streaming. I die in the film? All I can remember now is I propose to Holly, then we have a very nice, like, small honeymoon, and then instead of a ring, I give her a javelin, and then I think the film is over. What the heck? And then we have Boomer, who's pretty shocking. There's a big sequence where a chopper crashes and kind of goes into trees. But then when it comes down to these trees, it shoves all that shit into your face. Okay. I eat a bunch of the splinters in my face and my body, and seeing them recreate that with special effects was really cool. That helicopter sequence involves several different bits. The interactive elements of the helicopter blades hitting the trees as it's crashing. We went out there and we rigged every tree and we fired that sequentially so that we could blow the tops off of all the trees. Tree, tree, tree. Synced up with camera and lighting to simulate the helicopter hitting the trees. Mongal decides to be the hero. I got the word! And takes out the chopper. She jumps on the helicopter and doesn't realize how heavy she is. <laughs> And then it just kind of goes out of control and spins and yeah, and then Paul Boomer's in the way. Boomer! We 
did an interactive explosion on the beach, and then we placed a burning helicopter buck there to represent the helicopter. I think there are definitely some Boomerang fans who are going to be upset when they see the opening of the movie. This is your last chance. Turn back around. I love my ending in this film. It's like spectacular. Blowing up Rooker's head is a great joy to me. I've killed Michael Rooker in many of my movies. I look forward to killing him in many more and uh, in awful ways. We made a billion Michael Rooker heads that week. Actually, part of the hard part was we had this fake body in the water with an arm that, you know, sort of swims and then a head that explodes. This is a post-explosion uh, that we're going to shoot with. We'll dress this with fresh sort of uh, lovely things. We've got some lovely gelatinous bags of goo, which we'll put in those heads, and some other filler that will go in, and it, that'll help kind of explode the whole effect. The recent Squad One did not succeed, and its mission is that Javelin was not in charge. Um, I was just there following some orders, and then this ding-dong black god is very rude to everyone, and is his friends on the other side, which is not appropriate. You know, if you're wearing, like, a Celtic jersey, you do not pass it to the Lakers. I am definitely having fun with who's gonna live and who's gonna die. People are gonna be surprised by how many people don't make it to the end. <laughs> Give him a pissed off look like, are you fucking kidding me? You just shot across my face? Yeah, take your time with those beats. We're gonna need to take it. is the biggest cinematic dick swinging competition you've ever seen. When we look at a character, we basically break down what their attributes are and what we expect from them and how James has written them. Then we overlay that with who's playing it. So when we're talking about John, Incredibly physical athlete. He can sell any sort of physical movement. John Cena is the most incredible person I've met. Oh my God. <laughs> and then he turns into this weird maniac on screen. It's incredible. <laughs> Same with Idris. Idris can do everything. Just the silence of how he can move and how he can stand and hold postures and how he goes from one motion to another. Because most of the film, he's masked. Fuck. That's true. The gorilla camp scene was a difficult scene to balance the humor with the storytelling because they really do kill a lot of people who, at the end of the road, end up being good guys. So there is a belittling of life that both Peacemaker and Bloodsport do. Nothing like a bloodbath to start the day. They call you Peacemaker. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. Once I started storyboarding it and really got those two tracking shots along the side of the gorilla camp and them sort of one-upping each other as they go along, killing the people, that's where it all came to life. This will eventually become the gorilla camp and we're setting up our entire fight between Idris Elba's character and Peacemaker as they go through and plow down all these bad guys. We're sitting with some of these stunt actors trying to figure out exactly what the rhythm is going to be like and we can flash forward to that and you can see that now. We are here in our 40,000 square foot stage where we built a jungle indoors, which we surrounded by almost 800 feet of a backing that has a jungle printed on it. So you can look in all directions and it feels like we are in the jungles of South American island. When you walked, you know, from the pavement outside into the space that was entering the stage, just the air, it felt like you were out in the wild. We built that gorilla camp on sets, but it wasn't quite long enough for all the action that I needed. So what we needed to do was we went in the first day, we had gorilla camp push the housing for the gorillas. And we shot the first bit, went in the next day, moved that back, shot the next bit, and went in the next day and pulled it all the way back so there was enough room in the front of the set. And so we're actually just keep moving the set along through the forest and it's sort of an illusion that it's all fitting in there 
in the way that it is. He does throw polka dots at people. The guerrilla camp the first time we actually see what their abilities are. It was a really interesting choreography session with James in the sense that he wanted to show both elements of comedy within there. The first shot, when you're looking off, just take a beat, look together. This is the beginning of the big Western home. Two heroes going into town. Two, one, action! Yeah, that works really well. And so the idea was how can we show as many of his weaponry in the one sequence and in one shot. I certainly was expecting a large franchise offering that's built around action, but a lot of it is fighting, which is something that I'm confident in saying that's in my skill set. So I ended up doing most all of it. You know, they're all really willing to go that extra mile for James, both because they can, but also because they're inspired to do it by his leadership. God, that was the best, right? Yeah. Okay. You are able to see the unbridled power of what this group of individuals can do. It's not censored. You see how, at points, heartless these people are. It reminds you why we started in a prison. Between Bloodsport and Peacemaker, they're sort of both vying for that top position. It's just crazy what they do to try and up each other. Non-lethal, you lose. Exploding compression bullets. To me, a lot of what the movie is about, from Bloodsport's point of view at least, is what does it mean to be a man today? And he is toxic as hell. He is a guy who was brought up to have this mine's bigger than yours mentality about everything. If I can beat you up, I'm more of a man than you are. And that's what makes a man. You see the epitome of that journey in his face-off with Peacemaker in the guerrilla camp. It looks cool, I think. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's go to Jonheim. <laughs> we'll blow the tears off that thing and go home. I love things going wrong in movies. I love characters who are Let's go. starting to get things going and starting to work things out. Oh, fizzle sticks. And then all of a sudden they screw it up no! way worse than it would have been without them ever being there. Two, one, go! I remember writing that sequence and going, you're gonna hate yourself six months from now because water is the biggest pain in the ass to work with on set. And I wanted to do it all practically. We didn't want to do it with visual effects. We really wanted the actors to be caught up in this river of water. We looked at the whole sequence and we go, okay, well, what can't we do? Clearly, wide shots of a building with the visual effects. But anything other than that, we try to figure out how, from a rigging sense and a design point of view, we can do it for real. Ready and action! I mean, we shot the whole sequence in a real life sort of what it would feel like, you know, water and tilting sets. Action! We built a set that could fill with water. Yeah, he's really freaking the fuck out. The whole water sequence at Jotunheim was incredible. You had hundreds of gallons of water. 2,000 gallons of water. 50,000 pounds of water. I don't know, 60,000 tons of water or something? It was insane. Gallons of water just, like, throwing you around. It was Dan Sudik and his wonderful special effects team who put this all together for us. We explored building a giant gimbal on stage full of water, and the studio was like, no, you can't put that much weight on our stage. So we had to back into how we could get the shot and how we could do it on stage. And what we came up with is a large dump tank above the set. Then the set itself was built as a dump tank. The bottom tank held the 175,000 gallons. All right, let's bring the water. We had pumps in there. We could pump 18,000 gallons per minute back up into the set so the water would flow continuous. We built the dump tank with four hydraulic doors and we could hit them with just a little bit, or we could open it all at once and have a big ferocious water dump. 
I am standing inside of our Jotunheim cubicles office set. When we first started in here, this was dressed with about 100 cubicles. Everything was personalized with little details about every little worker that was here in our cubicle set. Who's Milton? What? I don't remember any Milton. Fuck! And then after the shooting company did that scene and they left, we came and brought in these partition walls that run the entire length of the cubicle set. We're gonna hold the water and keep it from expanding out and hitting all the sides of our stage. Okay, we're set. Yeah. And three, two, one, go! Special effects drops water there. It hits this black ramp here, shoots the water down the alleyway. Uh, 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 blows Harley Quinn back. And then we rigged this back wall piece as a breakaway wall piece that special effects pulled out to let all the water go and everybody rushes out and goes over the edge. Then we built the office space that would slant. We discussed whether or not we had to put all this on a giant gimbal and have it all slide, or the plan that we ended up coming up with was we rebuilt this office cubicle set at an 18 degree angle. We hung it 25 feet up in the air. It was an engineering marvel. All the actors, everybody strapped in with, with safety lines, and we did the run up the 18 degree slant with water coming down. Run! It was difficult, but they all got up there and ran and, and, and jumped. There are things like Xerox machines, paper cutters, water jugs, staplers, calendars with pictures of kittens on them, all bombarding their way towards me. Okay, cut. We ended up getting so much of this in camera, so that visual effects has to do very little to actually complete the scene. I hope that people come up to me and say, wow, that was CGI, right? When you got slammed with water, when you guys were hanging off that building, and I can't wait to be like, no, we did that. You know, everything was practical, like everything that you see on screen, that's how we shot it. It was a pain in the butt to shoot because you could only shoot a little piece, a little piece, a little piece, a little piece, and then it has to be built into this extraordinarily gigantic scene. but I think that ends up being one of the more fun sequences in the movie. Yeah. 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 Yeah.